I'm Miller Oberman, and even though you can't tell because I'm at my mom's house um, right now, we are um, coming to you from Eugene Lang College's first year writing program, who hosts these events. Um, this is the Craft Lesson Lunch series, and this is the second of our summer events. Um, this program, this, this fantastic lunch series program was started by our previous director, Scott Korb, um, and runs all through the school year. So every Tuesday from 12.30 to 1.30, uh, you can come have lunch with us, either virtually or in the future times, potentially in person, um, at which point we will also give you tasty lunch. Um, and hear one of our faculty members or a guest talk about aspects of craft. Um, so I'm joined here today by Rachel Eight, who's one of our fabulous faculty members at Eugene Lang's first year writing program. Um, and I will be back on July 21st with Jessica Gross, who's going to join me then also Tuesday, um, 1230 to 130 on July 21st to talk. Um, we are going to be talking about musicality um, in writing, which I'm very excited about. Um, so yeah, Rachel and I are going to talk today about taking note or taking notes um, and maybe the difference between those things. Um, and Rachel is going to screen share with us. So should we, should we start that? Sure. Okay. Hi. Welcome. Okay. Sharing. Hello. Okay. Can you see this? My little New York tough, can you see it? Yeah. And you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, when I picked this topic, which randomly, um, there's usually some phrases that are in a schedule and you can kind of sign up next to a phrase that you like. They're vague enough so that you can turn these talks into basically anything. And the one that I signed up for was taking notes and note taking in the last few months in New York has been a lot different than my typical note taking um, regimen, meaning that I like, I think a lot of my friends and family and neighbors have been in this sort of creative paralysis and just trying to absorb the different layers of what's happening. And so I began to take some photographs to kind of I didn't realize that at the time until I started thinking about this, but they were really a way for me to process what's been happening in my neighborhood and around us and that, you know, continues to happen. So, um, so this was something that caught my eye. Um, somebody had just painted, actually, I, I took this picture when I had one of my first um, reunions with a friend, we decided to meet up on her rooftop and have a drink so that we wouldn't be, you know, enclosed. Everybody's trying to work out how we do life now. And this was right outside of her building in Chinatown. And I love these garbage cans because they looked like a movie set to me. That's not what normal New York City garbage cans look like anymore. Um, I live on a street where there's a lot of film shoots and when they're filming stuff from the 70s, they bring in trash cans like that. So anyway, that's, <laughs> that's the first one. Um, my next note I took was, um, I've been going, I've had this really sweet hair salon on my block for about 17 years, and it's been more like family to me. Um, because they've watched my kid grow up. They would take care of him if he was locked out. We had each other's phone numbers and stuff. And so this was a note on Facebook of Petra saying that she was gonna have to close the shop. And uh, I, it just, she may be able to stay in another location, but these are the kinds of things that are happening all around us now that are really hard to absorb. Just even before you go to the next slide, just when I read this little note here yeah. that you wrote, I'm so struck by this sentence, please message me if you need to. Mm. There's something in that sentence that, that makes me realize that someone might need <laughs> to send a message to this person who runs a salon. Yeah. 
even just thinking about that, I can see that it's something more than the ordinary. Yeah, and she's also like, um, we would joke that she's she's like this ninja. She she studies martial arts and teaches classes and is a very spiritual person. And so I think in general, she has a lot of maternal energy that she is accustomed to um, weaving out in her normal daily life. And so I can imagine that for her, closing up this shop is a lot, it means a lot more than just, you know, snipping people's hair. So... Um, which is obvious to say, but yeah, that sounds very Petra. Message you if you need something. And she would be on the other end of it. Um, this, it's hard to see this, um, but it says defund NYPD. And I took this picture. I've started working out of a place called the Writer's Room on Astor Place. And I took this picture because to me, it looked like it said refund NYPD. And I kept wishing, you can't see the whole scale of the building, but there's probably about um, 30 or 40 stories to it. And I, I wished I could get a hold of this person and say, can you just move that over just a smidge? Because it's, it's, really <laughs> it's not resonating in the way that I think you want it to. And so um, anyway, it's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's like we want a refund. Like, yeah. what about all the money back? <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I've been, I live in the East Village and there's been rallies, protests um, every day coming through Washington Square. There was one this weekend, which um, there was a lot of attacks and brutality during the Pride March, which is just terrible. Um, and this image, what I was struck, this was Juneteenth, and all of these beautiful pictures of these paintings were created by an, a group called Artists for George, and they just were so striking. So. I love how the flag like works with the paintings too. Yeah, yeah, the color and it's been a lot to abs absorb. Like the protest presence in the neighborhood has been really interesting because I will hear them outside. I'll hear like waves of sound coming from outside of my window. I'm on 4th Street. And then in the afternoon at about four o'clock, I think that, that the, they tend to gather toward the end of the day, the late afternoon, and you'll hear the helicopters going above. So um, in terms of, you know, taking note, I'm taking note with all different kinds of senses. There's a lot of soundscape um, happening with the protests. And, you know, these, it, it kind of culminates and then dies down and you'll hear it again a few hours later. Yeah, I really, I just want to, draw attention to what you just said about the senses too because um i always I, I try to find moments in these conversations or talks to think about students and student writing um mm -hmm. that's what we do um and i think being reminded that note taking is not something you just do with language um or with one sense like we think of the visual sense maybe or the physical sense of writing or typing but mm -hmm. to um, to build our realities that we write from out of all of the senses and thinking about the sound, um, the sound of helicopters and then looking out your window and all of these linkages there. And also the idea of validating that because, you know, again, I have truly, as I know so many people have had a hard time feeling creative right now because so much has been going on and I think that to take photographs and even like walk around and do a sound recording, there's so many different ways to take notes and you can implement those things at any time. You know, we're, we're recording devices and uh, there's so many different ways to record. Obviously, pen and paper is probably our most natural as writers, right? But I just haven't been feeling it for, for months. And so um, 
in order to process it, I'm usually writing to process through things and I've had to find other ways. Yeah, I love the idea of a sound recording. Like if you just, if you just recorded sound for some period of time and then listened to it later and attempted to transcribe it maybe um, and describe the sound only. Um, I like writing exercises that kind of like single out one thing to focus on and not trying to do everything at once. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you ever feel like some of your students, they might have trouble coming up with ideas and if you just tell them to record what they're saying and kind of talk through it, if they listen back to it, they've practically written their paper. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. So yeah, like let's pay attention to these other ways that we're giving ourselves this recording, you know? Totally, I had a student who for their final project this spring, this person was really struggling to write. They were home, they were staying at their parents, they felt sort of stifled. Um, and they had been going on all of these sort of distanced walks with an old friend of theirs from high school. And what they wound up doing was recording and then transcribing one of the conversations that they had. Oh. It was really cool, um, but then it was also kind of displaced. And I was like, where did you have, I asked the student, where did you have this conversation? And they said, oh, I, we were at our old high school. And having, they were actually having this conversation, processing what was happening then, having been sent home from college, and like the distance they had come from being at high school and being left and then come back and all this. And they were actually processing it where they used to hang out at lunch at, at school. Oh. And I, oh, you just have to describe that setting. And it added so much yeah. to the final essay. It was so interesting, but they just transcribed. And the kid was like, I feel like I'm cheating kind of like, <laughs> it, doesn't, like cheating. it doesn't have to be painful and hard. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I'm always kind of terrified of writing dialogue. And I love the idea of just actually having a conversation and transcribing it and seeing where that lands, you know. Mm -hmm. This is uh, plywood appeared overnight everywhere. And uh, somebody had made a stencil of this Martin Luther King Jr. quote and had put it all over like every piece of plywood. So that was pretty beautiful to see. Um, I've lost a lot of people in my neighborhood. Uh, Frances Bolden did not die of COVID. She was, she was older and sick for a long time, but um, it kind of has just been compounded. A, a lot of people on my block did pass away. I have a, I live in a neighborhood which is called um, a NORC, like a naturally occurring retirement community. It's multi-generational. And so when people die, they put flyers up with a little bit about people's lives just to let us know what happened. So this was Frances. She lived a really extraordinary life fighting off Robert Moses. And this was my friend, Shirley. She did die of COVID. She was in um, a nursing home when she died and she was pretty fabulous so i love this photo i love it too and that's how i remember her i mean she had gotten she had dementia before she moved into this nursing home up in the bronx and our relationship had changed a lot she was very often looking for her dog who had died a long time ago so She'd say, have you seen Gizmo? And I'd say, Shirley, you may have a lot to worry about, but you don't have to worry about Gizmo. Gizmo's, <laughs> Gizmo hasn't been on this scene in a while. So, um, but this is just such a strong, beautiful image. And I miss her. But and somebody, I was, um, somebody came a few months later and left this. It popped up out of nowhere. Um, this is so extraordinary to me because I think that um, this person wasn't living in your building anymore, right? Wasn't in your exact neighborhood, had left and moved up to the Bronx, and yet all of this is popping up around the building where yeah. she used to live. Yeah. It's just it not- died in April and this popped up in June. So somebody just came by with these flowers and left this there. Don't know who it was. Yeah. Showed up one morning and uh, I, you see these kinds of pop-up memorials 
elsewhere in the Lower East Side, they, I've seen them as well. There's a lot of spray painting um, in memoriam, but this was unusual. I hadn't seen anything with these beautiful bouquets. Yeah, those flowers are beautiful. Yeah. I don't think that this is how people think of New York City. Like, do you think so or don't think so? Don't. Yeah. I don't think that people think that New York City is, it has the kind of close-knit communities um, where even when someone moves away to another part of the city that they would still be remembered this way mm -hmm. uh, where they had lived for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, down here, um, East Village, it literally feels like a village. You know, you see the same people every day, which is why this has been so painful. Um, the buildings aren't as high, you know, it, it literally feels like a village. And there are these demarcations between, you know, East Village, Lower East Side, Greenwich, West Village. And whenever I take a trip and cross the border into another one, I very much viscerally feel that I'm in a different neighborhood. So the, the differences are subtle, but they're there, you know. Washington Square, let's see. Oh, this has been obviously this, do you hear that thunder coming? Yeah. Um, this has been the one of the central places where protests have gathered and there's a table in there and it says, listen and learn. And I just love that. It would look like a school table had been set up and, and different people have been um, able to speak from that table. They'll stand on it and, um, it just, it, it seemed like this permanent new fixture that we needed to keep remembering to listen and learn that really stuck with me. I love that you just called it permanent because it's like, of course, like um, you know, any of our students will know that that's Bob's library in the background, right? Like yeah. this huge NYU building with all the books that you could ever need. Maybe not all the books you could ever need, but most of the books that you could ever need are in there. Yes. And it looks kind of brutal and is a little bit terrifying inside. Um, and yet here's this other structure of knowledge that's popped up in front of it. And it's yeah. round somehow. And actually in the second window from the very top facing the park, you can't see this, but um, that's apparently the president's office and there's a hawk cam because there's baby hawks that are born there and live there. So you can actually go on and see this whole kind of nature show happening. It's gross because they eat rats and stuff, but um, you know, we take what we can get yeah. in New York. Um, let's see, this should be a video. <laughs> this, I was, I was taking a bike ride over to the river on, the day that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of, um, help me verbalize this the correct way. What, it, what was the case actually called? Do you know? I don't know the, I don't know the court name of it. I know that it means that um, trans people cannot be fired from their jobs for being trans. Like, um, you know, but I mean, it wasn't done. Uh, so okay. Here's people celebrating in this moment where finally there was, um, there was just some real joy to pick up on. Yeah, and that's, and for anyone who doesn't recognize it, um, that's of course the Stonewall Inn um, where the initial riot um, that began the entire queer rights movement was started by black trans women, um, yeah. and brown trans women. Um, yeah, it is a site of, it is a site of holy pilgrimage. It sure is. It sure is. And I took this video because I was just so struck by the joy and I posted it and, um, it was funny because that day I got a note on Instagram from NBC asking me if they could broadcast it across their channels. And it just made me really happy to think that by taking a moment to capture something, it could be, you know, other people could experience this moment of joy and see how dearly value, valuable it is in this community and not just have it be a sound bite, you know? So I, I'm not used to taking video notes of things and it was just pretty funny to me that the one time I did it, 
it was picked up nationally. Oh, here's some other notes. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I'm going to es escape this and go back one. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and maybe we can talk a little bit more just about the, um, you know, the multisensorial note taking and different ways of taking notes. I did present a few different slides for actually taking notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I love that you just called the video that you took a note. Um, because of course it is. Um, and there were so many different ways that you were taking note in those slides mm -hmm. and on your neighborhood. And it's funny because one of the things that I was thinking about this morning when I was um, thinking that we were going to be talking today was, was that weeks ago, maybe even a month ago, I haven't looked back at my emails, but we had this little email exchange where you were like telling you this and that that I, is going on in the East Village today. And they were the tiniest little details, um, like that you had gone to the Puerto Rico coffee house on 8th Street. Um, yeah. And like, you didn't know that I love that coffee house mm -hmm. and that I've been going there since I was whatever, 20. Um, and just like what occurred to me was that those notes that you had taken, even in an email to me, so casually were so precious to me when I received them. Um, because I'm in Queens and I'm not riding the subway and I'm not coming to the East Village and I'm not seeing my barber who's also on Esther um, and I'm not going to Puerto Rico and getting my card stamped and like all of those little things that I used to see all the time um, I missed them so much and I didn't even realize how much I missed them until you said casually like oh Puerto Rico yeah, and they were so cute. I came in and they were wearing their little masks and it was just so, um, and you're not allowed to go back and where the coffee barrels are. They Most places have put up a bench so that you can't enter too far into the store or the restaurant for takeout. And uh, But there they were with their masks on, scooping the coffee. And it was these daily things, these moments that just have, I think helped me personally uh, cope through all the it's just too much to take in what's happening you know and giving ourselves those sensorial familiar pleasures and routines um it's now it feels like the most simple things that we used to do are treasures i mean this may sound really funny to people but my laundromat reopened you know, and just to be able to go, like, I know that I have to put a quarter in a certain way so that it doesn't get stuck and I don't have to bother them in the front. They get their letter opener and like press the quarter down. And, you know, these are like the daily things that we're not, we don't even think about. Mm -hmm. But when you do think of them, those are the kinds of things that, can you imagine like being able to pull in something small like that into fiction to cre help create um you know a setting or i don't know yeah and and even just in that little like seemingly insignificant story like that detail about the quarter it's like i'm getting a sound yeah um, an image a smell like all of these things um yeah. letter opener is such a great detail um, all of these, all of these little aspects are part of, are part of writing. So, I mean, to me, I would say, and I was, I said something about this before, but like, what is the connection between taking note and taking notes, plural? Um, and like one of, one of the ways that you just reminded me that they're connected in that story is just in the way that um, writing is about noticing. Yes what we see and take in and that has to do with a kind of radical openness mm -hmm. observation mm -hmm. you have to take note to take notes absolutely and I, I i pulled some actual notes together and um one of them let's see i'll start sharing my screen again i was thinking about the different ways that i take notes mm -hmm. and why i take them and for teaching, 
Is this okay in just the partial screen? Can you see that? I can see it. Okay. Um, my students, we were talking before about sending people out and doing a, a, a sound recording so that they can kind of get a sense of their ideas in a different way. When they're talking in class sometimes, um, you have to help them pull out their ideas, help them flesh them out. So this little thing, and I was just flipping through some notebooks, this is a quarantine Zoom class where my students were coming up with their final projects. And they were really struggling with them because they were, at this time, it wasn't put on your mask and go outside. It was everybody had to leave school in two days, pack up, go home. And now they're like having to do their final papers from their childhood bedrooms, you know? And so um, my student Larissa was really torn. She had to go to Paraguay and was just like dropped in another place, didn't know what to write about. And, and I said, well, let's talk about your every day. Like, what are you doing every day? And she started laughing and she said, I eat snacks every day. I love snacks. So we started thinking about, well, what can you say about snacks that you could flesh out into a research paper? And so um, I'm just taking notes as she's talking. Um, she eats popcorn, apples. She's been making this recipe from Bon Appetit, banana bread. Hasn't everybody been making banana bread? Um, and then I have a little note there that says like cultural differences is the snacking different. And we started talking about that. And she said that she's the snacks where she was are not processed in the same way that she would eat here. So that was kind of an entryway into being able to think about cultural differences in something basic. And I want to say that she's a tremendous thinker and writer. I had her in my last semesters writing the essay class and she is a sensorial writer because she was thinking about her obsession with coffee and her family is from Japan but had emigrated from Japan to Brazil to work on coffee farms and so just by talking about this obsession with coffee she was able to start making her own connections to the lineage of the role that coffee plays in her um, ancestral background. And so when she started talking about snacks, I was listening because I knew where she could roll out with that, you know? That's amazing. That's one of the, that's one of the great things about having students in both of these courses. And I love having students in writing the essay one and then again in writing the essay two because you get to know them and they're writing. Yeah. And such a lovely process to watch. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this taking notes is really just, I actually need to write down, I think, to process things sometimes, and I'll just forget. And when people are reading in a, when they're reading something in, say, a workshop, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if, if, I've, if I'm hearing it for the first time, I have to take notes to remember what I want to talk about or ask, or I just won't. Um, so this is something that you'll find a lot in my notebooks with, and with those little doodles and stuff. Um, I had to write a book review. And so this is a different kind of note taking that I did. Um, this book, Miracles Come on Mondays, is a collection of very short prose poems, whatever. She, gets, she calls it prose, but some of them are literally like five lines long. Mm -hmm. and her her pieces were like little riddles for me and so when i'm writing a book review i give myself permission to go bonkers with marginalia because i really need to keep track of the connections that i'm making on page i can't just assume i'm going to remember something like you know you, you have to when you're writing a book review you have to look at the whole thing and um this is a piece about a family playing air guitar, <laughs> but they're, they're actually like different vapors. They respond to vapors. It's so weird. So I was just trying to understand this and I had to take a lot of notes. I love her writing, but it was, it was new for me. Um, this is, you did a craft talk that I attended 
on Zoom, Miller, this is from your craft talk. Um, and there was a quote that you offered from Paul Muldoon, which I thought was so beautiful. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, form is a straight jacket, the way a straight jacket was for Houdini. I don't know if I took that down right, but you had used that in your craft talk and I thought it was so fascinating. I think that's really, I think the quote actually has the word straight jacket in it one more time, which is ridiculously silly. Yeah. I, I think it was form as a straight jacket the way a straight jacket was a straight jacket for Houdini. <laughs> I think he was just very excited about the word straight jacket. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I have a friend who's a teacher. Um, her name is Jill McDonough, and she's a fabulous poet. And I remember her saying that she would tell her students who were struggling with poetry to slap some meter on it. Just mm -hmm. slap some meter on it. And uh, this, I'm always thinking about how you can pour essay ideas into different pre-existing structures like Eulipus with the pain scale, um, things yeah. like that. And so this, this very visual picture of a straitjacket and Houdini and form and how it's like a trap, but then you can get out of it and even go further. I don't know. I just, I was really taken by that. Um, brilliant. It's a brilliant quote, I think. Like yeah. idea that, um, because it makes it so obvious because Houdini couldn't have done, couldn't have expressed his genius, right, without that. Yeah. And yeah. so rather than a trap, it's the opposite of a trap. Yeah. And uh, then, I don't know what you were talking, I wrote down, poems are ghosts, words are the sheet. You've got to keep the sheet sheer to see the poem. Yeah. Does any of this sound familiar to you, Miller? Yes. Okay. Th these are really good notes. Awesome. I <laughs> it's very odd for me because I don't know that I've ever seen someone's notes that they wrote of me talking, but I yeah. feel quite, I feel quite seen. Excellent. <laughs> you don't know the utility of what you're doing it as I'm doing it. I might not have gotten that right, but there was something there. Um, what else do we have? That's the teaching notes. Oh, the, the last one I have, the last slide here is I do a lot of freelance writing and one of my jobs is to basically, I ghost write blog posts. I do a lot of content development for, in this case, a design, a strategic design company called Design It. And um, somebody had given me a very complicated TED talk to listen to and then turn into an article. And it was called like making the invisible visible. And it was about all of these things that I didn't understand. And what I notice in my own note taking here is that I use arrows a lot. I think when there's a transition, I just write a quick arrow and then move into the next idea. And I don't know that I ever really was aware that I did that until trying to find something for, for this talk. Um, so somehow it just helps me absorb what I'm trying to say. Cause it's hard to do that when you're transcribing and listening to somebody else's talk and then you have to write it as if you're an expert in it. So there's always a lot of extra note taking when that's involved. Yeah. Yeah, the arrows are interesting. Yeah. I think I'm always using like making asterisks or like just making X, X's I use a lot of um, to just kind of say, oh, this thing was important. Look at this, like maybe bullet pointing sort of um, or like make, I'll make an asterisk sometimes at the spot and then like draw a line and make a note on the note somewhere else if it seemed like there was more to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you're, and that's again, speaking to taking notes as a process, you know, you've got to create these markers for yourself as it's happening while you're taking it in and you know you're going to reflect back and you're making all these connections. I mean, really, there's so much happening when you take notes. Well, yeah, I mean, it's funny because I think in some ways the processes that we both described are almost like we're using paper to make 
something close to tr Microsoft track changes before that existed. Yeah. But I think like one of the things for me, and I, I say this to my students so often when they don't know how to start is our minds move so quickly and we just have to find these ways to slow them down mm -hmm. because we tend to speak in generalizations and we're taught to write in these generalizations. Um, I mean, when I say we're taught to write, I mean, when we're taught to write badly, um, we're taught to write in these like five paragraph essays and like topic sentences and to generalize and it's so deadening um, and it's so, um, it, it lends itself not towards paying attention, but like summary. And that's what we have to do, isn't it? During writing the essay one, I feel like so much of our job is to have the students like break up with the five paragraph essay. Yeah. And it's scary because they're, you know, they're wedded to the form and it's been basically like beaten into them for years. And to actually say, you know what, that's, that's a great way to, you know, create your topic, support it with ideas, conclude it. But where is your thinking in that? Mm -hmm. You know, how yeah. do you kind of break apart the form and then help guide a student to seeing their own thinking process? Note taking is a little bit messy. And I think maybe that's why it lends itself towards that breakup. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm just going to say that there is a Q&A function and in maybe 10 minutes or so, we are going to look at any questions that people might have. So if, if people do have questions or if they've written down any notes of questions and they want to now type those, um, they can. Otherwise, we will, we will continue, but if you want to start thinking of something you want to ask either of us, go for it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think that um, that process, um, we're taught that writing should hide that process, right? Like you're supposed to come up with this perfect thing right away and it's supposed to be polished and perfected and we're not supposed to see any little threads hanging out um, or what went into it being made. But usually what went into it being made is like the most interesting part mm -hmm. and how to get that there. I find like giving students the opportunity to make a giant mess um, is really um, challenging sometimes for some of them and, inv and like invigorating. Because especially for students who did really well in school with the stuff that they were taught, right? Mm -hmm. students, who, students who like just did badly and could, like didn't get the five paragraph essay, like saying to those students, hey, you can do this other thing. They're like, great, knew it all along. But the students who like were easily doing well the other way, I think it's sometimes it's harder for them to like forsake it. Yeah. The topic of my class is writing what haunts us. And so I think part of the dismantling happens in getting students to just observe what is it that is actually interesting them in a real level. For Larissa, it's snacks, right? And we saw how that wound its way back to her heritage and this coffee farm in Brazil and this migration that her family took. I mean, but it started with her saying she was obsessed with coffee. And if you can just sort of keep prodding a little bit, like, well, so tell me more about that. Well, I needed to wake up, but okay, so you you don't drink tea? Let's talk about that. Um, that may sound like such a simplistic, funny example, but when you just there was there was another student who I had who became obsessed with um, with triangles and triangulating people and spaces and, and and that was really interesting that turned into a paper um but t when you give permission to young writers to examine what it is that they want to write about and actually value that i don't know i think that is powerful and it's something and frankly that i have to remind myself of every day because i don't always think that why would anybody want to hear that? Why is that important? Who cares? The world has so many big things going on. Um, 
so why is it urgent in a personal way to observe those thoughts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I used to have lunch with this really great poet uh, named Anna Bazichevich. And when I, I was working at a nonprofit and in, in Manhattan and we used to have lunch at this bar, which I can't remember the name of now. And I bet it's not there anymore, but it was like a very, it had been there for a million years. Um, and it was sort of this divey beer bar from back before there was a lot of craft beers but that would have like the fact that they had 25 beers or something was a really big deal. And it was German and you could just get like a, a like knockwurst and a potato or something for five bucks. Awesome. And so we would meet there and have like poetry workshops on our lunch breaks. And her, she writes these like very avant-garde experimental poems in my opinion. And I would read her poems and be like, where did you come up with these images? Like I would pay so much money if I could think this way. You know, and I said that to her one day. I was like, I wish I could write images the way that you write images. My poems are so literal and like straightforward. And she was like, what? Like your images are so surprising and shocking to me. And I feel like I never would have thought of those in a million years. And I wish I could write an image like that. one. And I was like, oh, right. Like what, what makes sense, what seems normal to each of us inside our own minds is completely fresh to so many other people. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're really speaking. And I think that's useful for people to remember too. And, and it was useful for me to learn. Um, that would seem like ban sort of banal to me in myself, um, wasn't. Yeah. I, I heard a talk from Charles Baxter, you know, Charles Baxter, um, he wrote a book called First Light, what a mm. bunch of books. but he gave a talk about um, lists and writing lists and how I've, I've thought about that a lot because if with fiction writing and this is you know different from essays obviously but with fiction writing if you're trying to evoke a specific time period or setting like the time markers that you choose to use can inform so much of your piece so he used an example of say like a tenement with a bare bulb and a string that you would pull yeah and something about that string and maybe it's dingy and um it just like taking note again to use that phrase of all these tiny little details can really blow out a whole time period and be a really interesting way to offer time markers instead of just mm. 1963 and the moon landing you know there's so many better ways to offer up a time that's so cool. So descriptively rather than narratively. Descriptively rather than narratively. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of also goes into the senses, you know, so what is it, what does it feel like if you're in one of those tenement style rooms and the wallpaper is peeling and it's damp and, um, and mm -hmm. the light is dingy, you know, then it, it kind of gives you like an entry point into the emotion of a scene too, not just the time period. Mm -hmm. They're like little gateways, you know? Yeah. 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 I think that sort of leads to this, this question that we've received a little bit. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to read this question from Scott Korb, um, mm -hmm. who says, <laughs> can you talk about your process of taking notes in the margins? It often feels like a way for me to speak back to the writer, to argue in a way that makes me feel heard. Does this happen for you? Do you have a specific memory of this? Do you have a common note you make? For me, it's wow. <laughs> this is also how I grade essays with wows in the margin. Cool. Let's respond to this. Yeah, I would love to respond to that. Um, I think when I'm thinking of the kinds of things that I tend to underline, exclamation point, circle, I respond a lot to the different way that objects are used in literature and how they can be used in different ways. I mean, this is really only since graduate school because the teacher told me, really banged it into our head, like, look at the objects, watch how the objects change. Um, so I'm often, often doing that, circling objects that might get repeated later to see if there's like a thematic undergrowth there. 
Um, I love wow. I'll do wow too. I tend to do stars, just like these really sloppy big stars to go back to something. And then I might not remember why I put a star next to them. How about you, Miller? What do you do? Um, I think I do my version of wow is like, yes. <laughs> like, I'll just be like, yes, this um, a lot and stars. But I would say um, <laughs> sometimes I do this. Sometimes I write KTD um, in the margins. And, and <laughs> I don't know when I started doing it. It was also probably grad school. But KTD is, stands for kids these days. Um, <laughs> and I use it because I feel like so often in academic writing, especially, I'll be reading something in a scholarly article. And I'll be like, yes, yes, you're making sense to me. I'm following this. And then, then they'll make an argument or a sentence that's essentially kids these days. And I'm like, no, you had me. And now you're just complaining. And it's ridiculous. Um, like when an argument sort of devolves into like, it used to be better than this. And I'm like, no, it didn't. <laughs> yeah, and I hate to say it, but sometimes there's, huh, you know? I wish I got everything, but especially in this Penelope Crane book that I was reviewing, it was just such an odd little, really gem of a book that I felt like I was having to uncrack un these riddles. And so I would sort of try to solve one riddle in the margin and then see if it answered to the second part of the piece. I don't know. Um, it definitely helps me just understand things sometimes, you know? I'm a slow reader. I've always been a slow reader. Mm. I read in the same pace as I speak, so. The other thing, yeah, the other thing, especially speaking to understanding, is like a lot of times what I'll do is I'll reference another writer or another text in the margin and I'll say, oh, this reminds me of this, or I wonder if this person was thinking of this writer. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm reading, that helps me to feel like I'm in conversation with the writer. Um, and then if I have thoughts like that when I'm reading student work, it's great too, because I'll be like, oh, you should read this if you haven't. Yeah. But, and I think that a little bit gets to Scott's question of answering back too. Um, to kind of say, yes, and this person said this too, or they said something similar, and to kind of think of a larger conversation, um, maybe a larger artistic or scholarly conversation. How do you, when you get like the inkling of a poem, Miller, how do you take note of that? And when do you know that you've moved from a thought, just like a regular passing through thought, to a, a work in progress? How do you take note of that shift? That's a really great question. Um, well, sometimes I'll write something down. If I just ha will have a thought and I'll think I don't want to forget this, mm -hmm. um, then I'll just, I'll make a note. And now, now I'm, sometimes I do it on my phone. Um, although I don't, I write on paper still, um, first drafts. And after that I do find like the new technologies, um, of <laughs> typewriters and such very um very useful KTD Miller. <laughs> yeah no i realize that paper and pen is a technology um but i still write for first drafts that way um sometimes i'll make a note on a phone if i have nothing else um but it's hard for me to i've never successfully composed that way yeah. um, but i guess when I notice something or I'm observing something and I just want to make sure that I really don't forget that, um, then I'll, I'll write it down. And then do you have time pass before like maybe another image or idea will feed into it? Or do, is it like you encounter a text that makes you think of that thing that you wrote a long time ago? Usually the way that I'll go back and re-engage with it is just when I have time to really sit down and write. Like, I don't tend to make, a, I don't tend to draft with a lot of notes usually that are like passing. Um, and I'm also a pretty bad note taker when people are talking. Like, <laughs> I'm, the notes that you took of my talk that you showed on the screen before are definitely better than any notes I've ever taken on a talk, probably. Because I, I struggle to like listen and write at the same time. Once I start writing, I'm not listening as well. Um, and it's so, such a frustrating toss up because of course, if you do make a note, then you can look at it again later. 
and then you get more depth in that area. Um, but maybe you miss something in the moment. So I'll try to like jot down a word or two so that I'm not missing the initial experience. Um, and then I can go back and like write more of what I remember. Yeah. It, when you're saying that, it makes me think about, um, I have, I come from a magazine background. M my first career was working at, um, in national magazines. I was at Cosmo Girl for eight years. And um, when, I, I always thought like the most successful interviews that people did were those when they were paying attention to the setting and, and well, let me go backwards. There's a cliche where if there's a celebrity interview, there would always be like the TD bopper actress girl is at the diner and we can't believe she's eating her hamburger. Have you ever seen that trope? I haven't read enough Cosmo Girl to have seen that trope, but I definitely believe. Like in a celebrity interview, like, I can't believe I'm sitting at this diner and she actually ordered a cheeseburger. So that was one thing that we would try to avoid. But, the, but <laughs> yeah. what is my point? I think I was just thinking about when you were talking about taking details of an initial experience, if you can be physically present when you're interviewing someone and take notes of those little things, um, it can help, I think, shape the whole conversation, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think that that is something, um, that physicality that actually, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? I, I think that we don't lose it in Zoom as much as we think that we do. Um, when we're in these virtual settings, we still completely have our own physicality. And I think inhabiting that is so useful to do and really thinking about it, um, continuing, continuing to be embodied, whatever that means for us and taking note of that because we are perceiving the world through our bodies, through our senses. Um, yeah. Yeah, like when I'm in, when I'm teaching at school, I have a really bad coffee habit. And if I sit, and especially like, I don't know about you, but at four in the afternoon classes, I need that coffee just to kind of get through that afternoon. And it's a prop, but it, yeah. it's like self-medicating, you know? It yeah. rounds me, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, I'm seeing if there's more, if we have more questions. <laughs> Can everyone see the questions? No. They can only see the ones that we've answered. Okay. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. But you're still you're still embodied in your space when you don't have that, and you're using these physical things to ground you. Yeah. I had some students in my queer page seminar um, in the fall who had like a serious candy habit, and especially with like a lot of sour gummies, and. It was very, it was funny and I sort of laughed at them at first, but then I realized that they were really being more embodied through that experience in class and they were also sharing and it was nice. Um, but like that sourness, I think the intensity of it actually was part of their experience um, in a way that I was like, who am I to scoff at this? Yeah. Was, yeah. Like little fidgeters and stuff. That's actually really, that would be a fun exercise would be, um, you know, prompt around something sour, different flavors, bringing the senses back in. Totally. Yeah, I'm a fidgeter from way back, so I guess I respect that stuff. I used to fall out of my chair in class. Well, not just in class, but in general, as a child, I would like move so much that I would fall out of my chair. Oh, do you know what they would have given you now, Miller? They've got these big rubber bands that they put around the, 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 the legs of the chairs. Really? And you're legs would have just bounced into the rubber band and it probably would have made you feel grounded. Either that or a weighted vest. A weighted vest. <laughs> yeah, speaking for people with ADHD everywhere, um, I'm glad that I grew up before a weighted vest. But yeah, I was like always falling out of my chair and stuff like that. And I think it was because there just wasn't room in the school experience for embodiedness. Like yeah. if someone would have just let me stand up, I think that would have been really helpful. Yeah, yeah. But taking note of these things, of how, how we experience the world and how, how it's coming to us is part of, it's not just what you see, but it's who you are when you see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And I think that going back to like my original images that I was using to capture this whole time frame was like COVID, um, George Floyd, you know, uh, there's been so much mourning going on that somehow just capturing visuals behind it has helped me process it a little bit, you know, and engage with it and try to be present for it. Cause it's hard to show up sometimes too, you know? Yeah, it really, it really is. And I think, um, part of that showing up, I think really speaks to a lot that, that I know I hear from my students and I'm guessing you do too, is like who, who gets to speak about what and from what positionality and like figuring out every time you sit down to write, like, who am I? What is my positionality? What should and can and must I say? Mm -hmm. And it's something that every person can do. Um, and as a writer has, has the responsibility to do. And so it's a kind of internal taking note. Mm -hmm. It's also, it can be problematic too. I mean, in fiction, who do you get to be? Yeah. Who can you write accurately? Who can you, um, what's your responsibility? And, and that's an ongoing conversation for another time, but it is a conversation that comes up in every fiction class I teach. And it seems like, the answer, and this isn't a real answer, but it's like, what is your purpose of inhabiting this body for this character? Yeah, what is, what is the purpose? Think about that really deeply, and then that will help you inform that decision, you know? Totally, absolutely. Um, that's useful to think about um, when, we, when we write and when we read. Mm -hmm. To some extent, I think like, writing in college is about closing that gap between who you are as a writer and who you are as a reader, which is again why taking note is so interesting because as Scott pointed out, you can take notes in the margin of a book, but then you're writing your own thing too. And so you're yes, kind of having a conversation with the writer as you're taking note. Exactly. Yeah. You're taking a lot of notes, Miller. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> We are, we are very close to out of time and I've gotten a time warning. Um, thank you all so much for being here with us. Um, this has been really fun. And yeah, I've gotten a one minute warning now. Uh, it's in all caps. I'm getting these warning notes. They're very alarming. <laughs> um, so Rachel, thank you so much. Hey, do you want to tell you want to say what class you're teaching in the fall? Oh, yes. In the fall, I'm teaching two classes. I'm teaching writing the essay one, writing what haunts us. Yes. And you should take that. And then another class I'm doing is the first year seminar, which is um, the New York literary landscape. So that's going to be a fun um, look at New York City and places and resources. And it'll be online, but we're figuring it out. That sounds amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. And I'll just remind you all um, once again that I will be back here in three weeks um, with Jessica Gross to talk about making music, music lessons in writing, which I'm very excited about. Um, and Jessica has a new book out. So maybe I'll get see if I can get her to talk about that too. Awesome. Thank you, Miller. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, everyone. Bye.